Well, hey, everybody, if you're into true crime and you like maps, you're not going to want to miss how we recently used GIS to help specialty divers find three dead bodies in three different parts of the United States. Now, GIS is mapping, and this game-changing technology can impact murder and missing person investigations if police agencies will only put it to work. So let's talk geographic and behavioral profiling. Several months ago over dinner, my buddy Jared Lysick of Adventures with Purpose talked to me about an upcoming road trip that his team would be taking in April or May of this year. Now, Jared asked me if I'd be interested in doing a little pre-search investigative work for his team where I'd examine the case like a cop would. He also wanted me to put another special skill I have to the test the use of geographic information systems, or or GIS. Now, in simple terms, he wondered if my 40 years of law enforcement experience, coupled with the last 16 years I've spent using maps to help public safety agencies around the world, put it to test and see if it could make a difference in these cases. Well, I was game, and I jumped in with both feet. Now, the first case we're going to explore in this episode is the case of James Amobili, who's been missing for 19 years. Now, over the years, family and friends have vacillated between his case being a homicide case, a suicide, or just the possibility that Jimmy, as he liked to go by, just wanted to escape and start a new life for himself. Now, this guy was born into a large family of six kids in the community of Ridley, just just south of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I actually lived just across the river from his hometown for a short period of time. Now, Jimmy lived an active, fulfilling life, and, and for the 38 years that preceded his disappearance, his family members, including his brother Dominic, weighed in on what kind of guy this was. Jimmy was married. He had two daughters. This was at the time he disappeared. Now, Jimmy took care of his family as a driver for UPS, United Parcel Service, and it was a job that this guy really loved. But Jimmy had a secret. He was diabetic, and eventually UPS discovered all of this and took him off his delivery route, grounding him to the warehouse. His brother Dominic told me of a time when diabetic events were so severe that Jimmy actually had to pull off the road confused. When these things happened, he would call Dominic and he would tell him, hey, I'm having trouble. I don't know where I am, etc." And Dominic would run to his aid, bring him something to eat that would get his blood sugars back up. Well, as I investigated this case, the family and I explored the possibilities that he was having some marital issues and that he might have fled the area to start a new life for himself. Now, this is all something that the family stated they really believed. And frankly, I wasn't surprised since many times it's the only way that a family can cope with missing loved ones. It it leaves them a measure of hope where hoping that he might be run off rather than dead would be just too difficult and final for them. Now, there were also rumors circling around that Jimmy had developed a prescription drug habit, and that may have led to selling illegal prescription drugs to other people that he knew. Some people theorized that this led to a drug deal gone bad and that he was murdered. And there were some interesting ghost stories around this kind of a mindset. But again, nothing seemed credible to me. Now, Jimmy Amobili worked graveyard shifts, and his wife worked during the day. And it was during the day that Jimmy would get his sleep. He, he, he or his wife would drop their daughters off at daycare. And then around 4.30 each day, Jimmy would pick up the girls from daycare, returning home where the family would have an evening together until Jimmy left for work. Well, after examining everything I could uncover on Jimmy's case, and frankly, after some really extensive interviews with his family, I was able to paint a mental picture of Jimmy's schedule on that December 4th morning in 2003. Now, using GIS and the evidence that I'd uncovered, 
I mapped out the areas where Jimmy traveled every single day, the, the UPS warehouse where he worked, but most importantly, the daycare provider's home and his home. Now, on this map, you can see the daycare center, and it's located about two miles to the west of Jimmy's home. Now, I used Esri routing solutions to project some travel times based on normal traffic times at 4.30 p.m. And, and based on those times, it would take about nine minutes for Jimmy to make that drive each day. Now, you can see by looking at this map that Jimmy didn't have many twists and turns to make. He came out of his house, made a left, and basically headed straight west making another left before he made his way into the babysitter's house. Now, providing locations to search for a dive team like Adventures with Purpose reduces the possible search areas. And frankly, we know that Jimmy's green 2002 Ford Explorer never turned up, not a sighting over the last 20 years. Now, that's really important because, frankly, vehicles generally don't just disappear. They're recovered at some point, and there's a record of them being recovered. Well, the only way they could simply disappear is if they were hidden somewhere where there are no witnesses, maybe tucked away in a garage or something, and nobody ever was able to see that vehicle. Or they were destroyed in a junkyard where they somehow got into the junkyard and there was no reporting of the vehicle identification number, the plate number, or anything like that. The only other possibility is that it's just plain hiding in plain sight somewhere. And that plain sight somewhere might actually be out of sight and underwater. Now, as we look at this map, we can see that there were a number of smaller riv rivers, Ridley Creek and others, that needed really close consideration. But it was, a, it was really doubtful to me that those on the primary route would have been deep enough for that vehicle to go into and to be hidden year-round. I mean, think about that. The water drops in the fall. In the spring, there's high runoff. That could displace the vehicle. But it really didn't seem probable. Now, there was also the Delaware River and the tributary leading into the Delaware River, a big river just to the south of Jimmy's house that couldn't be discounted. And taking into consideration some other things, that became really kind of intriguing. So we began to examine the forensic evidence and all of that other evidence that we'd collected on the case, again, including Jimmy's mobile phone data. Now, the data showed that Jimmy's phone was last seen inside the cell tower sector that I've indicated here. Now, this tower in those days was just an omnidirectional tower, meaning that it shot a signal out in 365-degree radius or a complete circle. In that circle is all that we could determine, and we know that the last phone signal and the last phone call was made inside the range of that tower, which incidentally was positioned right behind the police department. Since Jimmy took off to the babysitters without his phone or his wallet on that day, which this is really significant, it made sense that he made that phone call at 4.33 from his home. Makes perfect sense, in fact. He, he let the, the babysitter know that he had overslept and that he was on his way. Now, remember I talked about Jimmy having a diabetic issue and that he'd had previous bouts of confusion whenever his insulin was out of whack. Think about this. He woke up suddenly, probably really disoriented. We've all felt that kind of disoriented feeling when we wake up all of a sudden. I started theorizing that it's possible that he could have had a diabetic event as he drove from his home. Again, he was confused. And if confused, knowing that he had to go west and then turn south, we started theorizing, is it possible that he could have turned south much sooner than he normally did? Now, let's take a look at his travels, because here, again, he travels every single day from his house to the daycare center. It's a straight line. He turns south just before the daycare facility and goes in and picks up his kids. Now, we can see this location where the cell tower caught his last phone ping. It's in that, inside that radius of possibility. 
this fits perfectly with the scenario that he called from home, left without his mobile phone, then became disoriented, perhaps confused on the location where he was, but knew he had to turn south, and he instinctively made that turn to the south, thinking that he was going to the day tech care center. But instead, he continues south, down the road, and onto an old boat ramp and into the river. Now, those waters, in my opinion, had to be checked. And that's exactly what Doug Bishop and the Adventures with Purpose team did. After they searched the area for a short time, they found Jimmy Amobile's vehicle in the murky depths. (laughs) You're not going to want to miss their videos on recovering Jimmy's vehicle and, frankly, on bringing Jimmy Amobile home. His family, Dominic and others, sat on the dock as he was pulled from what had been his watery grave for 19 years. It was such an honor to play a small piece in bringing Jimmy home. And I really salute Jared's team for being able to go out and put that secret sauce they have together to find this kid. Well, hey folks, we're talking about how GIS is used by specialty divers to locate missing persons. This is Profiling Evil, and we've been honored to support Jared Lysick and the Adventures with Purpose team in some really special searches. I hope that you'll take a moment and subscribe to Profiling Evil. You know, we dig a little deeper into these true crime cases and we try to teach you a little bit about the investigative process and about profiling as we go along. You can see that I really like maps too, so I always try to include some GIS in those discussions. Now, helping AWP has been really rewarding. I like these guys. And we have to rely, like they do, on publicly available information. Sadly, and rarely, law enforcement will speak to us or provide any information. It, it, it really bugs me at time. In fact, I think it exposes one of the real frustrations within that profession that I retired from. You know, I'm now a true crime YouTuber and podcaster, and I find it incredibly frustrating that law enforcement hasn't evolved when it comes to unsolved cases. Now, they got to remain closed-lipped on things. But they do continue to be closed-lipped and refuse to acknowledge the power that's found in the true crime community. I hope they evolve, and I hope they learn that this community can really provide a lot of help. But it really requires that those of us in the community reach a whole lot higher to build some credibility. You know, most crimes examined by police departments collect things like location information, things like where the victim was last seen or where the victim likes to go. All of these things are associated with the victim and their daily routines, their hobby locations, or places that they buy their morning coffee. All of those things can tell us something about the missing person. And geography is so key. As we saw in the Immobile case, GIS technology adds insight into these investigations. It provides a visual representation and it maps and harnesses the power of citizen involvement. Now, information sharing leads to information gathering. By plotting out a case geographically, police investigators can gain some clarity about these cases. GIS causes us to ask maybe more questions than we might otherwise ask. And those questions oftentimes lead to analysis that can provide some answers. Answers like those found in the Jed Hall case of Idaho Falls, Idaho. And we're going to talk about that now. You see, it was a freezing January night in 2018 when Matthew Jed Hall wrote a suicide note. He donned tactical clothing, picked up a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, and he headed into the night. This kid disappeared for more than four years until science and gritty determination from those guys over at AWP uh, got involved in the case. Now, Jed's family, in my opinion, wasted a ton of money on a private investigator, a person who spun some half-baked tale that this kid ran away, perhaps even to join the French Foreign Legion. Now, again, in my opinion, the evidence of the case was frankly missed outright. 
Perhaps it's the cop in me, but after looking at the case for just a couple of days, I felt that the behavioral and the traditional forms of evidence didn't support the wild notion that the PI had come up with, that this kid drove to California or that he made it to Canada or that he joined the French Foreign Legion. And I'm not kidding. That's what the theory was. Well, this kid immediately cut all ties, according to the PI, with family, friends, a girl that he cared a great deal about, and everybody else. And you know what? To me, it just didn't make sense. Now, understandably, Jed's parents accepted this goofy theory because facing the more realistic probability was simply too painful. In their desperation, they hung on to the hope that he was alive and well. Well, what was more disturbing to me were the theories I was beginning to develop after talking with his parents, after examining the evidence, and after considering the forensic phone and and closed-circuit TV data that I found. I found myself retracing Jed's steps on that fateful day that he disappeared, starting at his home. You know, Jed was considered by everybody around him to be a happy kid who was doing pretty well in school. This kid was serving in a local unit of the Civil Air Patrol, and he wanted to go into the military after graduation from high school. Now, like most parents, Jed's folks looked beyond his quirkiness and just described him as a perfect kid who had good friends, including a girlfriend. Now, that special relationship appears to have fallen apart in the days preceding his disappearance. While everything reportedly was good on the outside, there's something that I call public personas, that that less than ideal stuff that was going on found in his journal entries and scratched manifestos. Jed left his family a number of clues about his private and even his secret life that were really troubling to me. Now, this is probably a perfect time to talk about how each of us project ourselves publicly, in private, and in secret. Now, think about your own experiences for a moment here. I'm going to make up a scenario, and I want you to think in your mind about this. I want you to put yourself in the position that I'm creating here. Let's say that you and someone that's very close to you, a a family member, for instance, are arguing In the middle of this argument, you are just really bugged by how badly the person's treating you. Now, you're both angry, and you're either ignoring or chastising each other, but it's an uncomfortable exchange. Now, during this fighting, a neighbor rings your doorbell to just stop in to say hello. This loved one who'd been treating you so poorly answers the door and greets the neighbor with pleasantries and happiness only to return back to the bad behavior once the neighbor leaves. Now, what are your thoughts when something like this happens? And think about it. Do you have any examples in your own life where you've witnessed these Jekyll and Hyde interactions? Well, if you're comfortable in doing so, take a moment, pause the video, and enter the responses in the chat area below. And when you return, we'll explore this phenomenon a little more deeply. Hey, welcome back. Our public persona is that face that we put on when we meet new people or we interact publicly. We hope that we'll gain the trust and confidence of those people around us. When we're in social media circles, it might be a screen name or an emoji we choose, the platform we support or the circles that we join. This is how we want the world to view us. And most of us want to appear happy and approachable, not mean-spirited and standoffish. That's public. Now, on the other hand, our private persona is generally reserved for those who are closest to us, and sadly at times it's less than impressive. In private, our weaknesses, our insecurities, our personal beliefs, they, they often rear their ugly head at this time. And we don't expose these private personas very often because it's just too risky. Now, think about Jed Hall for a moment. One of the private things in Jed's writings was a suicide note that he left behind for his parents. 
It contained comments that said, quote, I love you all very dearly. I'm sorry for what I'm going to do. I must kill myself. It was a good life while it lasted. I'm sorry. I will miss you all. Close quote. You know, in another example, Jed also left a very private note to a girlfriend at school on the day that he disappeared. That's the private personas. Now, the last persona that I want to just briefly speak about is this secret persona. Uh, Do you remember when I mentioned that Jed had scrawled a note that he wanted to settle a score on a man who assaulted a friend of his? Jed wrote a note about actually wanting to hunt down and shoot a man believed of sexually assaulting a friend of his. And later that night, the man's home was shot up. Now, I'm not saying it was Jed. I'm just saying those were interesting relationships. Now, using GIS, I retraced Jed's steps on the morning that he disappeared, beginning with the time he left his parents' home. Now, it appears that he quietly left their home shortly after 2 a.m. This is evident by the fact that the parents didn't wake up. Jed put on tactical clothing. He strapped a 9 millimeter semi-automatic handgun to his side. Now, using GIS, that's again, geographic information systems or mapping, and collecting CCTV camera footage and getting the, the forensic data from his mobile phone, I placed a couple of key locations on a map. It, it appears that after leaving his home, that Jed drove toward his high school. And around 2.30 a.m., Jed and his vehicle are spotted uh, next to the American Heritage Charter School, driving back and forth. He makes a couple of drive-bys in what I would theorize was just checking out the place and making sure he could get in there. Now, seconds later, he parked on the side of the building uh, right next to another camera. And he's seen on that camera breaking out the panel of glass next to the front door before entering the school. Let's watch this video that was posted on YouTube by EastIdahoNews.com. I think you're going to find this really interesting. So watch this closely. Did you happen to notice how quickly he moved through the school? I mean, this kid enters the school at 2.34.17 after breaking out the glass. In seven seconds, he makes his way to a locker, which he opens up, and then he places something inside. And we later learned that it was a letter and a gift and some money. Fifteen seconds later, He's exiting the building and climbing into his car. The teenager wasn't there to burglarize the building. He didn't spend any time looking around. This kid was focused. He went directly to a single locker. He left something, and then he walked out of the building. His actions were well thought out. His plan was executed with precision. Now, I don't know if you even caught this or not, and I'm going to play it again here but he left his vehicle running with the headlights on during his approach and his exit. If you look closely here, you can actually see exhaust coming out of the tailpipe as he returns to the car. Now, if we look at the timing of events, we can begin to theorize that Jed must have headed to the location where the shots rang out, somewhere to the north. This was the home of that alleged predator who hurt a friend. Now, he may have stopped at his home afterwards, or he may have driven around town for a bit. Uh, The shooting didn't get reported until that morning, many hours after it actually occurred. But again, I don't know that that matters. What we do know is that a forensic examination of his phone revealed that it was last seen at 6.48 a.m., approximately two and a quarter miles to the northeast of Jed's home, somewhere near the Snake River, Interstate 15, and Highway 20. 
In my opinion, this was the area that needed to be eliminated in the search. And based on the location of the cell tower where that last ping was recorded, we could theorize that Jed was somewhere in this area at 6.48 a.m. And his phone, at least his phone, pinged around the Snake River. Now, the current runs southward through this area. So the phone, which potentially means Jed and his vehicle, had to have entered the river upstream. That really only leaves a few locations where this boy could have gotten into the river purposely. Now, using this great 3D imagery from my friends over at NearMap, I, I really find it less likely that he somehow catapulted off the Highway 20 bridge. It appears that the barriers would have made that nearly impossible, especially in a small vehicle. Now, there are a number of places where he could have gained access to the river, and I've indicated those on the map, and this is the area of focus for the Adventures with Purpose divers. Now, on this map, I indicated where the cell tower location is and the cell sector where the last ping was recorded from Jed's phone. Now, it's possible that he could have driven across the bridge on the north side of Idaho Falls, throwing his phone into the Snake River, which caused it to tumble along until it finally quit transmitting a signal somewhere in the area of that cell sector. Or, more likely, Jed Hall could have done what he said he was going to do. He could have committed suicide, and he used the river to pull that off. Well, it didn't take long for the Adventures with Purpose team to discover a vehicle in that area of the Snake River. Now, it was an area that had been searched by the county search and rescue team long before Jared's team showed up. But Jared's team does things a little different. I mean, it took 20 minutes before divers confirmed that Jed's vehicle was the vehicle in the water. And when they removed it from the Snake River, they found remains inside, and the remains were later identified as belonging to the missing teen. The case on Jed Hall was closed. Well, now I want to take a minute and finish my last story of three missing person cases where GIS mapping helped recover the body by talking about the case of Diedrich Smith. Diedrich was last seen on the night of October 2, 2006. He'd been staying overnight at his girlfriend's house, and for some reason in the middle of the night, Diedrich's girlfriend got up and left the man alone, running to the store for a little late-night snack run. When she returned, Diedrich and his vehicle were gone. Oddly, Diedrich left his cell phone at the girlfriend's residence. She didn't think much about it, and she waited until the next day to call Diedrich's home, speaking to his mother, assuming that he was there. That's when the first missing person call happened. Now, here's what's tricky about this case. Diedrich had been previously diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, something that he took daily medication for. People wondered initially and throughout the last 16 years if Diedrich might have been murdered by his girlfriend or, or someone else, or if the kid just ran away to start a new life for himself. Well, here's what we know. For 16 years, Diedrich and his turquoise 1993 Pontiac Grand Am remained on the missing person list at the local police department. Nobody had any idea what may have happened to this young man. Well, the first thing that I wanted to do in the case was map out all the locations that Diedrich Smith would travel. You know, places like work, school, and his girlfriend's house. It, it was also important to map out where his home was in order to understand where his routes may have been driving to or from each of those locations. Now, the area was populated, and closer examination of the waterways near Highway 52 showed some interesting places, some back roads, and a few bodies of water that seemed kind of intriguing. There was a place called Salem Lake that was about 30 feet deep. It was, it was pretty intriguing, certainly deep enough to hide Derek's vehicle. 
Now, another area was Quarry Park, which had these incredibly steep walls that were up to like 150 feet deep. But there was one place that really stuck out, and it was near Diedrich's girlfriend's home. Now, using 3D imagery and routing software, I plotted a number of scenarios where Diedrich could have traveled. Now, remember, this kid was schizophrenic. So logical thinking was impossible whenever he was having a psychotic event. Now, there was one particular route that had a number of waterways that I felt like needed to be checked, including these two riverways. This first one, again, it's really difficult to tell how deep they are, whether they dry up in the fall. uh, But I knew that the AWP team could figure all that out once they hit the ground. Then there's a secondary river that followed a route that went to something much more intriguing to me, which was this small lake at the end of what was once a dead-end road going into the water. Looking at historic imagery, it seemed possible that Diedrich could have mistakenly driven into that body of water and simply disappeared. Well, as luck would have it, Doug Bishop made that one of his first areas to check, and he quickly discovered Diedrich's vehicle about 14 feet under the surface. The vehicle with human remains inside was recovered, and within a few days, it was determined that the remains belonged to Diedrich Smith. You know, I want to thank Jared Lysak and the entire Adventures with Purpose team for the chance that we had to provide some investigative and geographic support on these cases. I think there's real value in having an experienced investigator consider the facts of these cases. Now, in addition to 40 years of investigative experience, here at Profiling Evil, we have a unique understanding of geographic information systems. GIS is that thing that connects data to maps, and it provides a foundation for mapping and analyzing information. It's something that's used by scientists every single day. Now, looking at these cases geographically can increase a police agency's understanding, understanding of patterns and relationships. I really hope law enforcement will take a little deeper look into this. And I hope this has been something that you've enjoyed. And if you have enjoyed it, would you take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button? Ring the bell so that you get all of our videos. And you know what? you might consider going over to our webpage at profilingevil.com and sign up for our free electronic newsletter, The Bolo. And if you'd like to get more instruction on the criminal investigative process or profiling, consider joining our academy-level memberships. Your financial support's really appreciated. But most of all, thanks for supporting Profiling Evil. And we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.